The Book of the Damned by Charles Fort, Chapter 14b Nature, 14, 469 That, according to the astronomer J. R. Hind, Benjamin Scott, City Chamberlain of London, and Mr. Ray had, in 1847, seen a body similar to Vulcan cross the sun. Similar observation by Hind and Lowe, March 12, 1849. Launay Scientifique, 1876-9. Nature, 14.505. Body of apparent size of Mercury, seen January 29, 1860, by F. A. R. Russell and four other observers crossing the sun. De Vico's observation of July 12, 1837. Observatory 2.424. L'année scientifique 1865-16. That another amateur astronomer, M. Cumbrai of Constantinople, had written to Le Verrier that upon the 8th, 8th of March, 1865, he had seen a black point, sharply outlined, traverse the disk of the sun. It detached itself from a group of sunspots near the limb of the sun and took 48 minutes to reach the other limb. Figuring upon the diagram sent by M. Cumbrai, a central passage would have taken a a little more than an hour. This observation was disregarded by Le Verrier because his formula required about four times that velocity. The point here is that these other observations are as authentic as those that Le Verrier included, that then upon data as good as the data of Vulcan there must be other Vulcans. The heroic and defiant disregard then of trying to formulate one omitting the others, which by orthodox doctrine must have influenced it greatly, if all were in the relatively narrow space between Mercury and the Sun. Observation upon another such body of April 4, 1876, by M. Weber of Berlin. As to this observation, Le Verrier was informed by Wolf in August 1876, L'année scientifique, 1876-7, it made no difference, so far as can be shown, to this notable positivist. Two other observations noted by Hind and Denning, London Times, November 3, 1871, and March 26, 1873. Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, 2100. Standacher, February 1762, Lichtenberg, November 19, 1762, Hoffman, May 1764, Dango, January 18, 1798, Stark, February 12, 1820, an observation by Schmidt, October 11, 1847, is said to be doubtful, but Upon page 192, it is said that this doubt had arisen because of a mistaken translation, and two other observations by Schmidt are given, October 14, 1849, and February 18, 1850. Also, an observation by Loft, January 6, 1818. Observation by Steinheibel at Vienna, April 27, 1820. Monthly Notices, 1862. Hasse had collected reports of 20 observations, like Les Carbos. The list was published in 1872 by Wolf. Also, there are other instances like Gruthensen's. American Journal of Science, 228-446. Report by Pastorf that he had seen twice in 1836 and once in 1837 two round spots of unequal size moving across the sun, changing position relatively to each other and taking a different course, if not orbit. 
each time that, in 1834, he had seen similar bodies pass six times across the disk of the sun, looking very much like Mercury in his transits. March 22, 1876. But to point out Le Verrier's poverty-stricken average, or discovering planets upon a 50% basis, would be to point out the low percentage of realness in the quasi-myth stuff of which the whole system is composed. We do not accuse the textbooks of omitting this fiasco, but we do note that theirs is the conventional adaptation here of all beguilers who are in difficulties. The Diverting of Attention It wouldn't be possible in a real existence, with real mentality, to deal with, but I suppose it's good enough for the quasi-intellects that stupefy themselves with textbooks. The trick here is to gloss over Le Verrier's mistake and blame Les Carbeaux. He was only an amateur. Had delusions. The reader's attention is led against Les Carbeaux by a report from M. Lias, director of the Brazilian Coast Survey who at the time of Les Carbeaux's supposed observation had been watching the sun in Brazil and instead of seeing even ordinary sunspots had noted that the region of the supposed transit was of uniform intensity. But the meaninglessness of all utterances and quasi-existence. Uniform intensity turns our way as much as against us, or some day some brain will conceive a way of beating Newton's third law, if every reaction or resistance is or can be interpretable as stimulus instead of resistance. If this could be done in mechanics, there's a way open here for someone to own the world. Specifically in this matter, uniform intensity means that Les Carbeaux saw no ordinary sunspot, just as much as it means that no spot at all was seen upon the sun. Continuing the interpretation of a resistance as an assistance, which can always be done with mental forces, making us wonder what applications could be made with steam and electric forces. We point out that invisibility in Brazil means parallax quite as truly as it means absence, and inasmuch as Vulcan was supposed to be distant from the sun, we interpret denial as corroboration, method, of course, of every scientist, politician, theologian, high school debater. So the textbooks, with no especial cleverness, because no especial cleverness is needed, lead the reader into contempt for the amateur of Orgueil and forgetfulness of Le Verrier, and some other subject is taken up. But our own acceptance, that these data are as good as ever they were, that if someone of eminence should predict an earthquake, and if there should be no earthquake at the predicted time, that would discredit the prophet. But data of past earthquakes would remain as good as ever they had been. It is easy enough to smile at the illusion of a single amateur. The Mass Formation Frisia, Stark, De Coupes, Sidebottom, Les Carbeaux, Lumis, Gruthensen, De Vico, Scott, Ray, Russell, Hind, Lowe, Cumbrai, Weber, Standacher, Lichtenberg, Dango, Hoffmann, Schmidt, Loft, Steinheibel, Pastorf, these are only the observations conventionally listed relatively to an intramercurial planet. They are formidable enough to prevent our being diverted, as if it were all the dream of a lonely amateur. But they are a mere advance guard, 
From now on, other data of large celestial bodies, some dark and some reflecting light, will pass and pass and keep on passing. So that some of us will remember a thing or two after the procession's over, possibly. Taking up only one of the listed observations. Or our impression that the discrediting of Le Verrier has nothing to do with the acceptability of these data. In the London Times, January 10, 1860, is Benjamin Scott's account of his observation. That, in the summer of 1847, he had seen a body that had seemed to be the size of Venus crossing the sun. He says that, hardly believing the evidence of his sense of sight, he had looked for someone whose hopes or ambitions would not make him so subject to illusion. He had told his little son, aged five years, to look through the telescope. The child had exclaimed that he had seen a little balloon crossing the sun. Scott says that he had not had sufficient self-reliance to make public announcement of his remarkable observation at the time, but that in the evening of the same day he had told Dr. Dick, F.R.A.S., who had cited other instances in the Times, January 12, 1860, is published a letter from Richard Abbott, F.R.A.S., that he remembered Mr. Scott's letter to him upon this observation at the time of the occurrence. I suppose that at the beginning of this chapter, one had the notion that, by hard scratching through musty old records, we might rake up vague, more than doubtful data, distortable into what's called evidence of unrecognized worlds or constructions of planetary size. But the high authenticity and the support and the modernity of these of the accursed that we are now considering. And our acceptance that ours is a quasi-existence in which above all other things, hopes, ambitions, emotions, motivations, stands, attempt to positivize. That we are here considering an attempt to systematize. That is sheer fanaticism in its disregard of the unsystematizable. That it represented the highest good in the 19th century. That is monomania. But heroic monomania that was quasi-divine in the 19th century. But that this isn't the 19th century. As a doubly sponsored Brahmin in the regard of Baptists, the objects of July 29, 1878, stand out and proclaim themselves so that nothing but disregard of the intensity of monomania can account for their reception by the system. Or the total eclipse of July 29, 1878, and the reports by Professor Watson from Rawlins, Wyoming, and by Professor Swift from Denver, Colorado, that they had seen two shining objects at a considerable distance from the sun. It's quite in accord with our general expression, not that there is an intramercurial planet, but that there are different bodies, many vast things, near this earth, sometimes near the sun, sometimes orbitless worlds, which, because of scarcely any data of collisions, we think of as under navigable control, or dirigible superconstructions. Professor Watson and Professor Swift published their observations. Then the disregard that we cannot think of in terms of ordinary sane exclusions. The textbook systematists begin by telling us that the trouble with these observations is that they disagree widely. There's considerable respectfulness, especially for Professor Swift. But we are told that, by coincidence, these two astronomers, hundreds of miles apart, were eluded. Their observations were so different. Professor Swift, Nature, September 19, 1878. That his own observation was in close approximation to that given by Professor Watson. In the observatory, 2161, 
Swift says that his observations and Watson's were confirmatory of each other. The faithful try again that Watson and Swift mistook stars for other bodies. In the Observatory 2193, Professor Watson says that he had previously committed to memory all stars near the sun, down to the seventh magnitude, and he's damned anyway. How such exclusions work out is shown by Lockyer, Nature, August 20, 1878. He says, there is little doubt that an inter, intra-mercurial planet has been discovered by Professor Watson. That was before excommunication was pronounced. He says, if it will fit one of Le Verrier's orbits. It didn't fit. In Nature 21301, Professor Swift says, I have never made a more valid observation nor one more free from doubt. He's damned anyway. We shall have some data that will not live up to most rigorous requirements. But, if anyone would like to read how carefully and minutely these two sets of observations were made, see Professor Swift's detailed description in the American Journal of Science, 116, 313, and the technicalities of Professor Watson's observations in Monthly Notices 38.525. Our own acceptance upon dirigible worlds, which is assuredly enough more nearly real than attempted, concepts of large planets relatively near this Earth, moving in orbits but visible only occasionally, which more nearly approximates to reasonableness than does wholesale slaughter, of Swift and Watson and Frisch and Stark and de Coupy. But our own acceptance is so painful to so many minds that in another of the charitable moments that we have now and then, for the sake of contrast, we offer relief. The things seen high in the sky by Swift and Watson. Well, only two months before, the horse and the barn we go on with more observations by astronomers, recognizing that it is the very thing that has given them life, sustained them, held them together, that has crushed all but the quasi-gleam of independent life out of them. Were they not systematized, they could not be at all, except sporadically and without sustenance. They are systematized. They must not vary from the conditions of the system. They must not break away for themselves. The two great commandments, Thou shalt not break continuity. Thou shalt try. We go on with these disregarded data, some of which, many of which, are of the highest degree of acceptability. It is the system that pulls back its variations, as this earth is pulling back the Matterhorn. It is the system that nourishes and rewards, and also freezes out life with the chill of disregard. We do note that, before excommunication is pronounced, orthodox journals do liberally enough record unassimilable observations. All things merge away into everything else. That is continuity. So the system merges away and evades us when we try to focus against it. We have complained a great deal. At least we are not so dull as to have the delusion that we know just exactly what it is that we are complaining about. We speak seemingly definitely enough of the system, but we're building upon observations by members of that very system, or what we are doing, gathering up the loose heresies of the orthodox. Of course, the system fringes and ravels away having no real outline, a Swift will antagonize the system, and a Lockyer will call him back. But then a Lockyer will vary with a meteoric hypothesis, and a Swift will, in turn, represent the system. This state is to us typical of all intermediatist phenomena, or that not conceivably is anything, really anything, 
of its parts are likely to be their own opposites at any time. We speak of astronomers, as if there were real astronomers, but who have lost their identity in a system, as if it were a real system. But behind that system is plainly a rapport, or loss of identity, in the spirit of an era. Bodies that have looked like dark bodies, and lights that have been sunlight reflected from interplanetary objects, masses, constructions, lights that have been seen upon or near the moon. In Philosophical Transactions 8227 is Herschel's report upon many luminous points which he saw upon or near the moon during an eclipse. Why they should be luminous, whereas the moon itself was dark, would get us into a lot of trouble, except that later we shall, or we shan't accept, that many times have luminous objects been seen close to the earth at night. But numerousness is a new factor, or new disturbance, to our explorations. A new aspect of interplanetary inhabitancy or occupancy Worlds in hordes, or beings, winged beings perhaps, wouldn't astonish me if we should end up by discovering angels, or beings in machines, argosies of celestial voyagers. In 1783 and 1787, Herschel reported more lights on or near the moon, which he supposed were volcanic. The word of a Herschel has had no more weight in divergences from the orthodox than has had the word of a l'escarbot. These observations are of the disregarded. Bright spots seen on the moon, November 1821, Proceedings London Royal Society, 2167. For four other instances, see Loomis, Treatise on Astronomy, page 174. A moving light is reported in Philosophical Transactions, 84, 429. To the writer, it looked like a star passing over the moon, which, on the next moment's consideration, I knew to be impossible. It was a fixed, steady light upon the dark part of the moon. I suppose fixed applies to luster. In the report of the British Association, 1847-18, there is an observation by Rankin upon luminous points seen on the shaded part of the moon during an eclipse. They seemed to this observer like reflections of stars. That's not very reasonable, however. We have in the annual register, 1821-687, a light not referable to a star, because it moved with the moon, was seen three nights in succession, reported by Captain Cater, see Quarterly Journal, Royal Institute, 12-133. Philosophical Transactions, 112-237. Report from the Cape Town Observatory, a whitish spot on the dark part of the moon's limb three smaller lights were seen. The call of positiveness in its aspects of singleness or homogeneity, or oneness or completeness, in data now coming I feel it myself. Ele Verrier studies more than twenty observations. The inclination is irresistible to think that they all relate to one phenomenon. It is an expression of cosmic inclination. Most of the observations are so irreconcilable with any acceptance other than of orbitless, dirigible worlds that he shuts his eyes to more than two-thirds of them. He picks out six that can give him the illusion of completeness or of all relating to one planet. Or let it be that we have data of many dark bodies. Still do we incline almost irresistibly to think of one of them as the dark body in chief? Dark bodies floating or navigating in interplanetary space, and I conceive of one that
That's the Prince of Dark Bodies. Melanicus. Vast dark thing with the wings of a super bat or jet black super construction, most likely one of the spores of the evil one. The Extraordinary Year, 1883. London Times, December 17th, 1883. Extract from a letter by Hicks Pasha that in Egypt, September 24th, 1883, he had seen, through glasses, an immense black spot upon the lower part of the sun. Sunspot, maybe? One night an astronomer was looking up at the sky when something obscured a star for three and a half seconds. A meteor had been seen nearby, but its train had been only momentarily visible. Dr. Wolf was the astronomer. Nature, 86, 528. The next datum is one of the most sensational we have, except that there is very little to it. A dark object that was seen by Professor Heiss for 11 degrees of arc, moving slowly across the Milky Way. Gregg's Catalog, Report, British Association, 1867, 426. One of our quasi-reasons for accepting that orbitless worlds are dirigible is the almost complete absence of data of collisions. Of course, though in defiance of gravitation, they may, without direction, like human direction, adjust to one another in the way of vortex rings of smoke, a very human-like way, that is. But in Knowledge, February 1894, are two photographs of Brooks' comet that are shown as evidence of its seeming collision with a dark object, October 1893. Our own wording is that it struck against something. Professor Barnard's is that it had entered some dense medium which shattered it. For all I know, it had knocked against merely a field of ice. Melanicus. That upon the wings of a super bat he broods over this earth and over other worlds, perhaps deriving something from them, hovers on wings or wing-like appendages or planes that are hundreds of miles from tip to tip a super evil thing that is exploiting us. By evil, I mean that which makes us useful. He obscures a star. He shoves a comet. I think he's a vast, black, brooding vampire. Science, July 31st, 1896. That According to a newspaper account, Mr. W. R. Brooks, director of the Smith Observatory, had seen a dark, round object pass rather slowly across the moon in a horizontal direction. In Mr. Brooks' opinion, it was a dark meteor. In Science, September 14, 1896, a correspondent writes that in his opinion, it may have been a bird. We shall have no trouble with the meteor and bird mergers if we have observations of long duration and estimates of size up to hundreds of miles. As to the body that was seen by Brooks, there is a note from the Dutch astronomer Muller in the Scientific American, 75251, that upon April 4, 1892, he had seen a similar phenomenon. In Science Gossip, NS3135, are more details of the Brooks object, apparent diameter about one-thirtieth of the moon's. Moon's disk crossed in three or four seconds. The writer in Science Gossip says that 
on June 27, 1896, at one o'clock in the morning, he was looking at the moon with a two-inch achromatic power 44 when a long black object sailed past from west to east, the transit occupying three or four seconds. He believed this object to be a bird. There was, however, no fluttering motion observable in it. In the Astronomische Nachrichten, number 3477, Dr. Brendel of Griswold, Pomerania, writes that Postmaster Ziegler and other observers had seen a body about six feet in diameter crossing the sun's disk. The duration here indicates something far from the earth and also far from the sun. The thing was seen a quarter of an hour before it reached the sun. Time in crossing the sun was about an hour. After leaving the sun, it was visible an hour. I think he's a vast black vampire that sometimes broods over this earth and other bodies. Communication from Dr. F. B. Harris, Popular Astronomy, 2398, that upon the evening of January 27, 1912, Dr. Harris saw upon the moon an intensely black object. He estimated it to be 250 miles long and 50 miles wide. The object resembled a crow poised as near as anything. Clouds then cut off observation. Dr. Harris writes, I cannot but think that a very interesting and curious phenomenon happened. End of chapter 14. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, GIS dot DePaul dot EDU slash P McAfee. Chapter 15 of the Book of the Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Bott, www.flacker.ca. The Book of the Damned by Charles Fort, Chapter 15. Short chapter coming now, and it's the worst of them all. I think it's speculative. It's a lapse from our usual pseudo-standards. I think it must mean that the preceding chapter was very efficiently done, and that now, by the rhythm of all quasi-things, which can't be real things, if they're rhythms, because a rhythm is an appearance that turns into its own opposite and then back again. But now, to pay up, we're what we weren't. Short chapter, and I think we'll fill in with several points in intermediatism. A puzzle. If it is our acceptance that, out of the negative absolute, the positive absolute is generating itself, recruiting or maintaining itself, via a third state, or our own quasi-state, it would seem that we're trying to conceive of universalness manufacturing more universalness from nothingness. Take that up yourself. If you're willing to run the risk of disappearing with such velocity that you'll leave an incandescent train behind, and risk being infinitely happy forever, whereas you probably don't want to be happy. I'll sidestep that myself, and try to be intelligible by regarding the positive absolute from the aspect of realness instead of universalness, recalling that by both realness and universalness we mean the same state, or that which does not merge away into something else, because there is nothing else. So the idea is that out of unrealness, instead of nothingness, realness, instead of universalness, is, via our own quasi-state, manufacturing more realness. Just so, but in relative terms, of course, all imaginings that materialize into machines or statues, buildings, dollars, paintings, or books in paper and ink are graduations from unrealness to realness, in relative terms. It would seem, then, 
that intermediateness is a relation between the positive absolute and the negative absolute. But the absolute cannot be related. Of course, a confession that we can't really think of it at all, if here we think of a limit to the unlimited. Doing the best we can, and encouraged by the reflection that we can't do worse than has been done by metaphysicians in the past, we accept that the absolute can't be the related. So then, that our quasi-state is not a real relation if nothing in it is real. On the other hand, it is not an unreal relation if nothing in it is unreal. It seems unthinkable that positive absolute can, by means of intermediateness, have a quasi-relation, or be only quasi-related, or be the unrelated in final terms, or, at least, not be the related in final terms. As to free will and intermediatism, same answer as to everything else. By free will we mean independence, or that which does not merge away into something else. So, in intermediateness, neither free will nor slave will, but a different approximation for every so-called person toward one or the other of the extremes. The hackneyed way of expressing this seems to me to be the acceptable way, if in intermediateness there is only the paradoxical, that we're free to do what we have to do. I am not convinced that we make a fetish of the preposterous. I think our feeling is that in first gropings there's no knowing what will afterward be the acceptable. I think that if an early biologist heard of birds that grow on trees, he should record that he had heard of birds that grow on trees. Then let sorting over of data occur afterward. The one thing that we try to tone down, but that is to a great degree unavoidable, is having our data all mixed up like Long Island and Florida in the minds of early American explorers. My own notion is that this whole book is very much like a map of North America in which the Hudson River is set down as a passage leading to Siberia. We think of Monstrator and Melanicus, and of a world that is now in communication with this earth. If so, secretly, with certain esoteric ones upon this earth. Whether that world's Monstrator and Monstrator's Melanicus must be the subject of later inquiry. It would be a gross thing to do, solve up everything now and leave nothing to our disciples. I have been very much struck with phenomena of cup marks. They look to me like symbols of communication. But they do not look to me like means of communication between some of the inhabitants of this earth and other inhabitants of this earth. My own impression is that some external force has marked, with symbols, rocks of this earth from far away. I do not think that cup marks are inscribed communications among different inhabitants of this earth because it seems too unacceptable that inhabitants of China, Scotland, and America should all have conceived of the same system. Cup marks are strings of cup-like impressions in rocks. Sometimes there are rings around them, and sometimes they have only semicircles. Great Britain, America, France, Algeria, Circassia, Palestine, they're virtually everywhere, except in the far north, I think. In China, Cliffs are dotted with them. Upon a cliff near Lake Como, there is a maze of these markings. In Italy and Spain and India, they occur in enormous numbers. Given that a force, say, like electrical force, could, from a distance, mark such a substance as rocks, as from a distance of hundreds of miles, selenium can be marked by telephotographers, but I am of two minds. The lost explorers from somewhere and an attempt from somewhere to communicate with them, so a frenzy of showering of messages towards this lost earth, in the hope that some of them would mark rocks near the lost explorers, or that somewhere upon this earth there is an especial rocky surface or receptor or polar construction or a steep conical hill upon which for ages have been received messages from some other world, but that at times messages go astray and mark substances perhaps thousands of miles from the receptor. That perhaps forces behind the history of this earth have left upon the rocks of Palestine and England and India and China records that may some day be deciphered, of their misdirected instructions to certain esoteric ones, Order of the Freemasons, the Jesuits. I emphasize the row formation of cup marks. Professor Douglas, Saturday Review, November 24, 1883.
Whatever may have been their motive, the cup markers show a decided liking for arranging their sculpturings in regularly spaced rows. That cup marks are an archaic form of inscription was first suggested by Canon Greenwell many years ago. But more specifically adumbratory to our own expression are the observations of Rivet Karnak, Journal Royal Asiatic Society, 1903-515. That the Braille system of raised dots is an inverted arrangement of cup marks. Also that there are strong resemblances to the Morse code. No tame and systemized archaeologist can do more than casually point out resemblances and merely suggest that strings of cup marks look like messages because china switzerland algeria america if messages they be there seems to be no escape from attributing one origin to them then if messages they be i accept one external origin to which the whole surface of this earth was accessible for them something else that we emphasize that rows of cup marks have often been likened to footprints but in this similitude their unilinear arrangement must be disregarded of course often they're mixed up in every way but arrangement in single lines is very common it is odd that they should so often be likened to footprints i suppose there are exceptional cases but unless it's something that hops on one foot or a cat going along a narrow fence top i don't think of anything that makes footprints one directly ahead of another cop in a station house walking a chalk line perhaps upon the witch's stone near ratho scotland there are twenty-four cups, varying in size from one and a half to three inches in diameter, arranged in approximately straight lines. Locally, it is explained that these are tracks of dogs' feet. Prox Society, Antiquities, Scotland, 2-4-79 Similar marks are scattered bewilderingly all around the witch's stone, like a frenzy of telegraphing, or like messages repeating and repeating, trying to localize differently. In Invernessshire, cup marks are called fairy's footmarks. At Valna's Church, Norway, and St. Peter's Ambletues, there are such marks said to be horses' hoofprints. The rocks of Clare, Ireland, are marked with prints supposed to have been made by a mythical cow. Folklore, 21-184. We now have such a ghost of a thing that I'd not like to be interpreted as offering it as a datum. It simply illustrates what I mean by the notion of symbols, like cups or like footprints, which, if like those of horses or cows, are the reverse of, or the negatives of, cups, of symbols that are regularly received somewhere upon this earth, steep conical hill somewhere, I think, but that have often alighted in wrong places, considerably to the mystification of persons waking up some morning to find them upon formerly blank spaces. An ancient record, still worse, an ancient Chinese record, of a courtyard of a palace, dwellers of the palace waking up one morning, finding the courtyard marked with tracks like the footprints of an ox, supposed that the devil did it. Notes and Queries, 9-6-225 End of chapter 15 Recording by Don Bott, www.flacker.ca Chapter 16 of the Book of the Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Bott, www.flacker.ca. The Book of the Damned by Charles Fort. Chapter 16 Angels. Hordes upon hordes of them. Beings massed like the clouds of souls or the commingling whiffs of spirituality, or the exhalations of souls that Doré pictured so often. It may be that the Milky Way is a composition of stiff, frozen, finally static, absolute angels. We shall have data of little Milky Ways moving swiftly, or data of hosts of angels not absolute or still dynamic. I suspect, myself, that the fixed stars are really fixed, and that the minute motions said to have been detected in them are illusions. I think that the fixed stars are absolutes. Their twinkling is only the interpretation by the intermediatist state of them. I think that soon after Leverrier died, a new fixed star was discovered, 
that if dr gray had stuck to his story of the thousands of fishes from one pail of water had written upon it lectured upon it taken to street corners to convince the world that whether conceivable or not his explanation was the only true explanation had thought of nothing but this last thing at night and first thing in the morning his obituary another nova reported in monthly notices i think that milky ways of an inferior or dynamic order have often been seen by astronomers of course it may be that the phenomena that we shall now consider are not angels at all we are simply feeling around trying to find out what we can accept some of our data indicate hosts of rotund and complacent tourists in interplanetary space but then data of long lean hungry ones i think that there are out in interplanetary space super tamer lanes at the head of hosts of celestial ravagers which have come here and pounced upon civilizations of the past cleaning them up all but their bones or temples and monuments for which later historians have invented exclusionist histories but if something now has a legal right to us and can enforce its proprietorship they've been warned off it's the way of all exploitation i should say that we're now under cultivation that we're conscious of it but have the impertinence to attribute it all to our own nobler and higher instincts. Against these notions is the same sense of finality that opposes all advance. It's why we rate acceptance as a better adaptation than belief. Opposing us is the strong belief that, as to interplanetary phenomena, virtually everything has been found out. Sense of finality and illusion of homogeneity, but that what is called advancing knowledge is violation of the sense of blankness. A drop of water. Once upon a time, water was considered so homogeneous that it was thought of as an element. The microscope, and not only that the suppositiously elementary was seen to be of infinite diversity, but that in its protoplasmic life there were new orders of beings. Or the year 1491, and a European looking westward over the ocean, he's feeling that that suave western droop was unbreakable that gods of regularity would not permit that smooth horizon to be disturbed by coasts or spotted with islands the unpleasantness of even contemplating such a state wide smooth west so clean against the sky spotted with islands geographic leprosy but coasts and islands and indians and bison in the seemingly vacant west lakes mountains rivers one looks up at the sky the relative homogeneity of the relatively unexplored one thinks of only a few kinds of phenomena but the acceptance is forced upon me that there are modes and modes and modes of interplanetary existence things as different from planets and comets and meteors as indians are from bison and prairie dogs a supergeography or celestiography of vast stagnant regions but also of super niagaras and ultra mississippis and a super sociology voyagers and tourists and ravagers the hunted and the hunting the super mercantile the super piratic the super evangelical sense of homogeneity or our positivist illusion of the unknown fate of all positivism astronomy and the academic ethics and the abstract the universal attempt to formulate or to regularize an attempt that can be made only by disregarding or denying or all things disregard or deny that which will eventually invade and destroy them. Until comes the day when some one thing shall say and enforce upon infinitude, Thus far shalt thou go, here is absolute demarcation. The final utterance. There is only I. In the monthly notice of the RAS, 11-48, there is a letter from the Reverend W. Reed, that, Upon the 4th of September, 1851, at 9.30 a.m., he had seen a host of self-luminous bodies passing the field of his telescope, some slowly and some rapidly. They appeared to occupy a zone several degrees in breadth. The direction of most of them was due east to west, but some moved from north to south. The numbers were tremendous. They were observed for six hours. Editor's Note May not these appearances be attributed to an abnormal state of the optic nerves of the observer? In monthly notices, 12-38, Mr. Reed answers that he had been a diligent observer, with instruments of a superior order, for about 28 years. 
but I have never witnessed such an appearance before. As to illusion, he says that two other members of his family had seen the objects. The editor withdraws his suggestion. We know what to expect, almost absolutely, in an existence that is essentially Hibernian. We can predict the past, that is, look over something of this kind, written in 1851, and know what to expect from the exclusionists later. If Mr. Reed saw a migration of dissatisfied angels, numbering millions, they must merge away, at least subjectively, with commonplace terrestrial phenomena. Of course, disregarding Mr. Reed's probable familiarity of twenty-eight years' duration with the commonplaces of terrestrial phenomena. Monthly Notices, 12-183 Letter from Rev. W. R. Dawes That he had seen similar objects, and in the month of September, that they were nothing but seeds floating in the air. In the report of the British Association, 1852-235, there is a communication from Mr. Reed to Professor Baden-Powell that the objects that had been seen by him and by Mr. Dawes were not similar. He denies that he had seen seeds floating in the air. There had been little wind, and that had come from the sea, where seeds would not be likely to have origin. The objects that he had seen were round and sharply defined, and with none of the feathery appearance of thistledown. He then quotes from a letter from C. B. Chalmers, F. R. A. S., who had seen a similar stream, a procession, or migration, except that some of the bodies were more elongated. He might have argued for sixty-five years. He'd have impressed nobody of importance. The supermotif, or dominant, of his era was exclusionism and the notion of seeds in the air assimilates, with due disregards, with that dominant. Or pageantries here upon our earth, and things looking down upon us, and the crusades were only dust clouds, and glints of the sun on shining armor were only particles of mica in dust clouds. I think it was a crusade that Reed saw, but that it was right, relatively to the year 1851, to say that it was only seeds in the wind, whether the wind blew from the sea or not. I think of things that were luminous with religious zeal, mixed up, like everything else in intermediateness, with black marauders from grey to brown beings of little personal ambitions. There may have been a Richard Coeur de Lyon on his way to right wrongs in Jupiter. It was right, relatively to 1851, to say that he was a seed of a cabbage. Professor Coffin, USN, Journal, Frank Institute, 88-151 that, during the eclipse of August 1869, he had noted the passage across his telescope of several bright flakes resembling thistle-blows floating in the sunlight. But the telescope was so focused that, if these things were distinct, they must have been so far away from this earth that the difficulties of orthodoxy remain as great, one way or another, no matter what we think they were. They were well-defined, says Professor Coffin. Henry Waldner, Nature, 5-304. That, April 27, 1863, he had seen great numbers of small, shining bodies passing from west to east. He had notified Dr. Wolf of the Observatory of Zurich, who had convinced himself of this strange phenomena. Dr. Wolf had told him that the similar bodies had been seen by Sig Capocci of the Capodimonte Observatory at Naples, May 11, 1845. The shapes were of great diversity, or different aspects of similar shapes. Appendages were seen upon some of them. We are told that some were star-shaped, with transparent appendages. I think myself it was a Mohammed and his hijira. May have been only his harem. Astonishing sensation. Afloat in space with ten million wives around one. Anyway, it would seem that we have considerable advantage here inasmuch as seeds are not in season in April, but the pulling back to earth, the bedraggling by those sincere but dull ones of some time ago. We have the same stupidity, necessary functioning stupidity, of attribution of something that was so rare that an astronomer notes only one instance between 1845 and 1863 to an everyday occurrence. On Mr. Waldner's assimilative opinion that he had seen only ice crystals, whether they were not very exclusive veils of a super harem, or planes of a very light material, we have an impression of star-shaped things with transparent appendages 
that have been seen in the sky. Hosts of small bodies, black this time, that were seen by the astronomers Herrick, Bois Bayot, and de Coupes. L'année scientifique, 1860-25. Vast numbers of bodies that were seen by M. Lamy to cross the moon. L'année scientifique, 1874-62. Another instance of dark ones. Prodigious number of dark spherical bodies reported by Messier, June 17, 1777. Arago, Ouvre, 9-38. Considerable number of luminous bodies which appeared to move out from the sun in diverse directions. Seen at Havana during eclipse of the sun, May 15, 1836, by Professor Ulber. Poey. M. Poey cites a similar instance of August 3, 1886. Monsieur Lotard's opinion that they were birds, L'Astronomie, 1886 391, large number of small bodies crossing disk of the sun some swiftly, some slowly, most of them globular, but some seemingly triangular, and some of more complicated structure. Seen by Mr. Trouvelet, who, whether seeds, insects, birds, or other commonplace things, had never seen anything resembling these forms. L'Année Scientifique, 1885-8. Report from the Rio de Janeiro Observatory of vast numbers of bodies crossing the sun some of them luminous and some of them dark, from some time in December 1875 until January 22, 1876. La Nature, 1876-384. Of course, at a distance, any form is likely to look round or roundish, but we point out that we have notes upon the seeming of more complex forms. In L'Astronomie, 1886-70, is recorded Monsieur Briguer's observation at Marseille, April 15th and April 25th, 1883, upon the crossing of the sun by bodies that were irregular in form. Some of them moved as if in alignment. Letter from Sir Robert Inglis to Colonel Sabine. Report British Association, 1849-17. That, at 3 p.m. August 8th, 1849, at Gaius, Switzerland, Inglis had seen thousands and thousands of brilliant white objects, like snowflakes in a cloudless sky. Though this display lasted about twenty-five minutes, not one of these seeming snowflakes was seen to fall. Inglis says that his servant fancied that he had seen something like wings on these whatever they were. Upon page 18 of the report, Sir John Herschel says that in 1845 or 1846, his attention had been attracted by objects of considerable size in the air, seemingly not far away. He had looked at them through a telescope. He says that they were masses of hay not less than a yard or two in diameter. Still, there are some circumstances that interest me. He says that, though no less than a whirlwind could have sustained these masses, the air about him was calm. No doubt wind prevailed at the spot, but there was no roaring noise. None of these masses fell within his observation or knowledge. To walk a few fields away and find out more would seem not much to expect from a man of science, but it is one of our superstitions that such a seeming trifle is just what, by the spirit of an era we'll call it, one is not permitted to do. If those things were not masses of hay, and if Herschel had walked a little and found out, and had reported that he had seen strange objects in the air, that report, in 1846, would have been as misplaced as the appearance of a tail upon an embryo still in its gastrula era. I have noticed this inhibition in my own case many times. Looking back, why didn't I do this or that little thing that would have cost so little and have meant so much? Didn't belong to that era of my own development. Nature, 22-64. That, at Katnau, Germany, about half an hour before sunrise, March 22, 1880, an enormous number of luminous bodies rose from the horizon and passed in a horizontal direction from east to west. They are described as having appeared in a zone or belt. They shone with a remarkably brilliant light. So they've thrown lassoes over our data to bring them back to earth. But they're lassoes that cannot tighten. We can't pull out of them. We may step out of them or lift them off. Some of us used to have an impression of science sitting in calm, just judgment. Some of us now feel that a good many of our data have been lynched. 
if a crusade perhaps from mars to jupiter occur in the autumn seeds if a crusade or outpouring of celestial vandals is seen from this earth in the spring ice crystals if we have record of a race of aerial beings perhaps with no substantial habitat seen by someone in india locusts this will be disregarded if locusts fly high they freeze and fall in thousands nature 47-581 locusts that were seen in the mountains of india at a height of 12750 feet in swarms and dying by thousands but no matter whether they fly high or fly low, no one ever wonders what's in the air when locusts are passing overhead, because of the falling of stragglers. I have especially looked this matter up. No mystery when locusts are flying overhead. Constant falling of stragglers. Monthly Notices, 30-135 An unusual phenomenon noticed by Lt. Herschel, October 17th and 18th, 1870, while observing the sun at Bangalore, India. Lieutenant Herschel had noticed dark shadows crossing the sun, but away from the sun there were luminous moving images. For two days bodies passed in a continuous stream, varying in size and velocity. The lieutenant tries to explain, as we shall see, but he says, As it was, the continuous flight for two whole days in such numbers, in the upper regions of the air, of beasts that left no stragglers, is a wonder of natural history, if not of astronomy. He tried different focusing. He saw wings. Perhaps he saw planes. He says that he saw upon the objects either wings or phantom-like appendages. Then he saw something that was so bizarre that, in the fullness of his nineteenth-centuryness, he writes, There was no longer doubt. They were locusts or flies of some sort. One of them had paused. It had hovered. Then it had whisked off. The editor says that, at the time, Countless locusts had descended upon certain parts of India. We now have an instance that is extraordinary in several respects. Super voyagers or super ravagers. Angels, ragamuffins, crusaders, emigrants, aeronauts, or aerial elephants, or bison, or dinosaurs. Except that I think the thing had planes or wings. One of them has been photographed. It may be that in the history of photography, no more extraordinary picture than this has ever been taken. L'Astronomie, 1885-347 That, at the Observatory of Sacaticus, Mexico, August 12, 1883, about 2,500 meters above sea level, were seen a large number of small, luminous bodies entering upon the disk of the sun. Monsieur Bonilla telegraphed to the observatories of the city of Mexico and of Puebla. Word came back that the bodies were not visible there. Because of this parallax, M. Bonilla placed the bodies relatively near the earth. But when we find out what he called relatively near the earth, birds or bugs or hosts of a super Tamerlane or an army of a celestial Richard Coeur de Lyon, our heresies rejoice anyway. His estimate is less distance than the moon. One of them was photographed. See L'Astronomie, 1885 349. The photograph shows a long body surrounded by indefinite structures or by the haze of wings or planes in motion. L'Astronomie, 1887 66. Signor Rico of the Observatory of Palermo writes that, November 30th, 1880, at 8 30 o'clock in the morning, he was watching the sun when he saw slowly traversing its disk bodies in two long parallel lines and a shorter parallel line. The bodies looked winged to him, but so large were they that he had to think of large birds. He thought of cranes. He consulted ornithologists and learned that the configuration of parallel lines agrees with the flight formation of cranes. This was in 1880. Anybody now living in New York City, for instance, would tell him that also it is a familiar formation of aeroplanes. But, because of data of focus and subtended angles, these beings or objects must have been high. Signor Rico argues that condors have been known to fly three or four miles high, and that heights reached by other birds have been estimated at two or three miles. He says that cranes have been known to fly so high that they have been lost to view. Our own acceptance, in conventional terms, 
is that there is not a bird of this earth that would not freeze to death at a height of more than four miles. That if condors fly three or four miles high, they are birds that are especially adapted to such altitudes. Signor Rico's estimate is that these objects or beings or cranes must have been at least five and a half miles high. End of chapter 16. Recording by Don Bott, www.flacker.ca. Chapter 17 of Book of the Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee. The Book of the Damned by Charles Fort. Chapter 17a. The vast dark thing that looked like a poised crow of unholy dimensions. Assuming that I shall ever have any readers, let him or both of them, if I shall ever have such popularity as that, note how dim that bold black datum is at the distance of only two chapters. The question, was it a thing or the shadow of a thing? Acceptance either way calls not for mere revision, but revolution in the science of astronomy. But the dimness of the datum of only two chapters ago, the carved stone disk of Tarbus, and the rain that fell every afternoon for twenty, if I haven't forgotten myself, whether it was twenty-three or twenty-five days, upon one small area. We are all Thompsons, with brains that have smooth and slippery, though corrugated surfaces, or that all intellection is associative, or that we remember that which correlates with a dominant and a few chapters go by, and there's scarcely an impression that hasn't slid off our smooth and slippery brains of the Verrier and the planet Vulcan. There are two ways by which irreconcilables can be remembered, if they can be correlated in a system more nearly real than the system that rejects them, and by repetition and repetition and repetition. Vast black thing like a crow poised over the moon. The datum is so important to us because it enforces in another field our acceptance that dark bodies of planetary size traverse this solar system. Our position that the things have been seen. Also that their shadows have been seen. Vast black thing poised like a crow over the moon. So far it is a single instance. By a single instance we mean the negligible. In Popular Science 34 158, Service tells of a shadow that Schroeder saw in 1788 in the lunar Alps. First he saw a light, but then when this region was illuminated he saw a round shadow where the light had been. Our own expression that he saw a luminous object near the moon, that that part of the moon became illuminated and the object was lost to view, but that then its shadow underneath was seen. Service explains, of course. Otherwise, he'd not be Professor Service. It's a little contest in relative approximations to realness. Professor Service thinks that what Schroeder saw was the round shadow of a mountain in the region that had become lighted. He assumes that Schroeder never looked again to see whether the shadow could be attributed to a mountain. That's the crux. Conceivably, a mountain could cast a round, and that means detached, shadow in the lighted part of the moon. Professor Service could, of course, explain why he disregards the light in the first place. Maybe it had always been there in the first place. If he couldn't explain, he'd still be an amateur. We have another datum. I think it is more extraordinary than vast thing, black and poised, like a crow over the moon, but only because it's more circumstantial, and because it has corroboration, do I think it more extraordinary than vast poised thing, black as a crow, over the moon. 
Mr. H. C. Russell, who was usually as orthodox as anybody, I suppose, at least he wrote F-R-A-S after his name, tells in the observatory, 2374, one of the wickedest or most preposterous stories that we have so far exhumed. That he and another astronomer, G. D. Hurst, were in the Blue Fountains, near Sydney, New South Wales, and Mr. Hurst was looking at the moon. He saw in the moon what Russell calls one of those remarkable facts, which, being seen, should be recorded, although no explanation can at present be offered. That may be so. It is very rarely done. Our own expression upon evolution by successive dominants and their correlates is against it. On the other hand, we express that every era records a few observations out of harmony with it, but adumbratory or preparatory to the spirit of eras still to come. It's very rarely done. Lashed by the phantom scourge of a now passing era, the world of astronomers is in a state of terrorism, though of a highly attenuated, modernized, devitalized kind. Let an astronomer see something that is not of the conventional celestial sights, or something that is improper to see, his very dignity is in danger. Some one of the corralled and scourged may stick a smile into his back. He'll be thought of unkindly. With a hardihood that is unusual in his world of ethereal sensitivenesses, Russell says of Hurst's observation, he found a large part of it covered with a dark shade, quite as dark as the shadow of the earth during an eclipse of the moon. But the climax of hardihood on impropriety or wickedness, preposterousness or enlightenment. One could hardly resist the conviction that it was a shadow, yet it could not be the shadow of any known body. Richard Proctor was a man of some liberality. After a while we shall have a letter which once upon a time we'd have called delirious. Don't know that we could read such a thing now for the first time without incredulous laughter, which Mr. Proctor permitted to be published in Knowledge. But a dark unknown world that could cast a shadow upon a large part of the moon, perhaps extending far beyond the limb of the moon, a shadow as deep as the shadow of this earth. Too much for Mr. Proctor's politeness. I haven't read what he said, but it seems to have been a little coarse. Russell says that Proctor freely used his name in the echo of March 14, 1879, ridiculing this observation which had been made by Russell as well as Hearst. If it hadn't been Proctor, it would have been someone else. But one notes that the attack came out in a newspaper. There is no discussion of this remarkable subject, no mention in any other astronomic journal. The disregard was almost complete, but we do note that the columns of the observatory were open to Russell to answer Proctor. In the answer, I note considerable intermediateness. Far back in 1879, it would have been a beautiful positivism if Russell had said, There was a shadow on the moon. Absolutely, it was cast by an unknown body. According to our religion, if he had then given all his time to the maintaining of this one stand, of course breaking all friendships, all ties with his fellow astronomers, his apotheosis would have occurred, greatly assisted by means well known to quasi-existence, when its compromises and evasions and phenomena that are partly this and partly that are flouted by the definite and uncompromising. It would be impossible in a real existence, but Mr. Russell, of quasi-existence, says that he did resist the conviction, that he had said that one could hardly resist, and most of his resentment is against Mr. Proctor's thinking that he had not resisted. It seems too bad, if apotheosis be desirable. The point in intermediatism here is... Not that to adapt to the conditions of quasi-existence is to have what is called success in quasi-existence, but is to lose one's soul. But is to lose one's chance of attaining soul.
self or entity. One indignation, quoted from Proctor, interests us. What happens on the moon may at any time happen to this earth. Or, that is just the teaching of this department of advanced astronomy, that Russell and Hurst saw the sun eclipsed relatively to the moon by a vast dark body, that many times have eclipses occurred relatively to this earth by vast dark bodies, that there have been many eclipses that have not been recognized as eclipses by scientific kindergartens. There is a merger, of course. We'll take a look at it first, that, after all, it may have been a shadow that Hurst and Russell saw, but the only significance is that the sun was eclipsed relatively to the moon by a cosmic haze of some kind, or a swarm of meteors close together, or a gaseous discharge left behind by a comet. My own acceptance is that vagueness of shadow is a function of vagueness of intervention, that a shadow as dense as the shadow of this earth is cast by a body denser than hazes and swarms. The information seems definite enough in this respect, quite as dark as the shadow of this earth during the eclipse of the moon. Though we may not always be as patient toward them as we should be, it is our acceptance that the astronomic primitives have done a great deal of good work, for instance, in the allaying of fears upon this earth. Sometimes it may seem as if all science were to us very much like what a red flag is to bulls and anti-socialists. It's not that. It's more like what unsquare meals are to bulls and anti-socialists. Not the scientific, but the insufficient. Our acceptance is that evil is the negative state, by which we mean the state of maladjustment, discord, ugliness, disorganization, inconsistency, injustice, and so on. As determined in intermediateness, not by real standards, but only by higher approximations to adjustment, harmony, beauty, organization, consistency, justice, and so on. Evil is outlived virtue or incipient virtue that has not yet established itself or any other phenomenon that is not in seeming adjustment, harmony, consistency with a dominant. The astronomers have functioned bravely in the past. They've been good for business. The big interests think kindly, if at all, of them. It's bad for trade to have an intense darkness come upon an unaware community and frighten people out of their purchasing values. But if an obscuration be foretold, and if it then occur, may seem a little uncanny, only a shadow, and no one who was about to buy a pair of shoes runs home panic-stricken and saves the money. Upon general principles we accept that astronomers have quasi-systematized data of eclipses, or have included some and disregarded others. They have done well, they have functioned, but now they're negatives, or they're out of harmony. If we are in harmony with a new dominant, or the spirit of a new era, in which exclusionism must be overthrown, if we have data of many obscurations that have occurred, not only upon the moon, but upon our own earth, as convincing of vast intervening bodies, usually invisible, as is any regularized predicted eclipse, one looks up at the sky. It seems incredible that, say, at the distance of the moon, there could be, but be invisible, a solid body, say, the size of the moon. One looks up at the moon at a time when only a crescent of it is visible. The tendency is to build up the rest of it in one's mind. But the unillumined part looks as vacant as the rest of the sky, and it's of the same blueness as the rest of the sky. There's a vast area of solid substance before one's eyes. It's indistinguishable from the sky. In some of our little lessons upon the beauties of modesty and humility, we have picked out basic arrogances, tail of a peacock, horns of a stag, dollars of a capitalist, eclipses of astronomers. 
Though I have no desire for the job, I'd engage to list hundreds of instances in which the report upon an expected eclipse has been sky overcast or weather unfavorable. In our super Hibernia, the unfavorable has been construed as the favorable. Some time ago, when we were lost, because we had not recognized our own dominant, when we were still of the unchosen and likely to be more malicious than we now are, because we have noted a steady tolerance creeping into our attitude. If astronomers are not to blame, but are only correlates to a dominant, we advertised a predicted eclipse that did not occur at all. Now, without any especial feeling except that of recognition of the fate of all attempted absolutism, we give the instance, noting that, though such an evil thing to orthodoxy, it was orthodoxy that recorded the non-event. Monthly Notices of the RAS 8132 Remarkable Appearances During the Total Eclipse of the Moon on March 19, 1848 In an extract from a letter from Mr. Forster of Bruges, it is said that, according to the writer's observations at the time of the predicted total eclipse, the moon shone with about three times the intensity of the mean illumination of an eclipsed lunar disk, that the British consul at Ghent, who did not know of the predicted eclipse, had written inquiring as to the blood-red color of the moon. This is not very satisfactory to what used to be our malices. But there follows another letter from another astronomer, Walkie, who had made observations at Cliste saint Laurent's that instead of an eclipse, the moon became, as is printed in italics, most beautifully illuminated, rather tinged with a deep red, the moon being as perfect with light as if there had been no eclipse whatever. I note that Chambers, in his work upon eclipses, gives Forster's letter in full, and not a mention of Walkie's letter. There is no attempt in monthly notices to explain upon the notion of greater distance of the moon, and the Earth's shadow falling short, which would make as much trouble for astronomers if that were not foreseen as no eclipse at all. Also, there is no refuge <clears throat> in saying that virtually never, even in total eclipses, is the moon totally dark, as perfect with light as if there had been no eclipse whatever. It is said that at the time there had been an aurora borealis, which might have caused the luminosity, without a datum, that such an effect by an aurora had never been observed upon the moon. But single instances, so an observation by Scott in the Antarctic. The force of this datum lies in my own acceptance, based upon especially looking up this point, that an eclipse nine-tenths of totality has great effect, even though the sky be clouded. Scott, Voyage of the Discovery, Volume 2, page 215. There may have been an eclipse of the sun, September 21st, 1903, as the almanac said, but we should, none of us, have liked to swear to the fact. This eclipse had been set down at nine-tenths of totality. The sky was overcast at the time. So it is not only that many eclipses unrecognized by astronomers as eclipses have occurred, but that intermediatism or impositivism breaks into their own seemingly regularized eclipses. Our data of unregularized eclipses, as profound as those that are conventionally or officially recognized, that have occurred relatively to this Earth. In Notes and Queries, there are several allusions to intense darknesses that have occurred upon this Earth quite as eclipses occur, but that are not referable to any known eclipsing body. Of course, there is no suggestion here that these darknesses may have been eclipses. My own acceptance is that if in the 19th century anyone had uttered such a thought as that, he'd have felt the blight of a dominant, that materialistic science was a jealous God, excluding, as works of the devil, all utterances against the seemingly uniform, regular, periodic, that to defy him would have brought on, withering by ridicule, shrinking away by publishers, contempt of friends and family, 
justifiable grounds for divorce, that one who would so defy would feel what unbelievers in relics of saints felt in an earlier age, what befell virgins who forgot to keep fires burning in a still earlier age, but that, if he'd almost absolutely hold out, just the same, new fixed star reported in monthly notices. Altogether, the point in positivism here is that by dominance and their correlates, quasi-existence strives for the positive state, aggregating around a nucleus, or dominant, systematized members of a religion, a science, a society, but that individuals who do not surrender and submerge may of themselves highly approximate to positiveness, the fixed, the real, the absolute. In Notes and Queries 2.4.139, there is an account of a darkness in Holland in the midst of a bright day, so intense and terrifying that many panic-stricken persons lost their lives stumbling into the canals. Gentleman's Magazine, 33414. A darkness that came upon London, August 19, 1763, greater than at the great eclipse of 1748. However, our preference is not to go so far back for data. For a list of historic dark days, see Humboldt, Cosmos, 1, 120. Monthly Weather Review, March 1886-79, that according to the La Crosse Daily Republican of March 20th, 1886, darkness suddenly settled upon the city of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, at 3 p.m., March 19th. In five minutes, the darkness equaled that of midnight. Consternation. I think that some of us are likely to overdo our own superiority and the absurd fears of the Middle Ages. Oshkosh. People in the streets rushing in all directions. Horses running away. Women and children running into cellars. Little modern touch, after all. Gas meters instead of images and relics of saints. This darkness, which lasted from eight to ten minutes, occurred in a day that had been light but cloudy. It passed from west to east, and brightness followed. Then came reports from towns to the west of Oshkosh that the same phenomenon had already occurred there. A wave of total darkness had passed from west to east. Other instances are recorded in the monthly weather review, but as to all of them, we have a sense of being pretty well eclipsed ourselves by the conventional explanation that the obscuring body was only a very dense mass of clouds. But some of the instances are interesting. Intense darkness at Memphis, Tennessee for about 15 minutes at 10 a.m. December 2, 1904. We are told that in some quarters a panic prevailed, and that some were shouting and praying and imagining that the end of the world had come. M.W.R. 32.522 At Louisville, Kentucky, March 7, 1911, at about 8 a.m. duration, about half an hour, had been raining moderately, and then hail had fallen. The intense blackness and general ominous appearance of the storm spread terror throughout the city. M.W.R. 39.345 However, this merger between possible eclipses by unknown dark bodies and commonplace terrestrial phenomena is formidable. As to darknesses that have fallen upon vast areas, conventionality is smoke from forest fires. In the U.S. Forest Service Bulletin, number 117, F. G. Plummer gives a list of 18 darknesses that have occurred in the United States and Canada. He is one of the primitives, but I should say that his dogmatism is shaken by vibrations from the new dominant. His difficulty, which he acknowledges, but which he would have disregarded had he written a decade or so earlier, is the profundity of some of these obscurations. He says that mere smokiness cannot account for such awe-inspiring dark days. So he conceives of eddies in the air, concentrating the smoke from forest fires. 
then in the inconsistency or discord of all quasi-intellection that is striving for consistency or harmony he tells of the vastness of some of these darknesses of course mr plummer did not really think upon this subject but one does feel that he might have approximated higher to real thinking than by speaking of concentration and then listing data of e enormous area or the opposite of circumstances of concentration because of his nineteen instances nine are set down as covering all new england in quasi-existence everything generates or is part of its own opposite every attempt at peace prepares the way for war all attempts at justice result in injustice in some other respect so mr plummer's attempt to bring order into his data with the explanation of darkness caused by smoke from forest fires results in such confusion that he ends up by saying that these daytime darknesses have occurred often with little or no turbidity of the air near the earth's surface or with no evidence at all of smoke except that there is almost always a forest fire somewhere however of the eighteen instances the only one that i'd bother to contest is the profound darkness in canada and northern parts of the united states november nineteenth eighteen nineteen which we have already considered its concomitants lights in the sky fall of a black substance shocks like those of an earthquake in this instance the only available forest fire was one to the south of the ohio river for all i know soot from a very great fire south of the ohio might fall in montreal canada and conceivably by some freak of reflection light from it might be seen in montreal but the earthquake is not assimilable with a forest fire on the other hand it will soon be our expression that profound darkness fall of matter from the sky lights in the sky and earthquakes are phenomena of the near approach of other worlds to this world it is such comprehensiveness as contrasted with inclusion of a few factors and disregard for the rest that we call higher approximation to realness or universalness a darkness of april seventeenth nineteen o four at wimbledon england simon's meteorological magazine thirty nine sixty nine it came from a smokeless region no rain no thunder lasted ten minutes too dark to go even out in the open as to darkness in great britain one thinks of fogs but in nature twenty five two eighty nine there are some observations by major j herschel upon an obscuration in london january twenty second eighteen eighty two at ten thirty a m so great that he could hear persons upon the opposite side of the street but could not see them it was obvious that there was no fog to speak of annual register eighteen fifty seven one thirty two an account by charles a murray british envoy to persia of a darkness of may twentieth eighteen fifty seven that came upon baghdad a darkness more intense than ordinary midnight when neither stars nor moon are visible after a short time the black darkness was succeeded by a red lurid gloom such as i never saw in any part of the world panic seized the whole city a dense volume of red sand fell this matter of sand falling seems to suggest conventional explanation enough or that the simoon heavily charged with terrestrial sand had obscured the sun but mr murray who says that he had had experience with simoons gives his opinion that it cannot have been a simoon it is our comprehensiveness now or this matter of concomitants of darknesses that we are going to capitalize it is all very complicated and tremendous and our own treatment can be but impressionistic but a few of the rudiments of advanced seismology we shall now take up or the four principal phenomena of another world's close approach to this world 
If a large substantial mass or superconstruction should enter this Earth's atmosphere, it is our acceptance that it would sometimes, depending upon velocity, appear luminous or look like a cloud, or like a cloud with a luminous nucleus. Later we shall have an expression upon luminosity, different from the luminosity of incandescence, that comes upon objects falling from the sky or entering this Earth's atmosphere. Now our expression is that worlds have often come close to this Earth, and that smaller objects, size of a haystack, or size of several dozen skyscrapers lumped, have often hurtled through this Earth's atmosphere and have been mistaken for clouds because they were enveloped in clouds. Or that around something coming from the intense cold of interplanetary space, that is, of some regions, our own suspicion is that other regions are tropical. The moisture of this Earth's atmosphere would condense into a cloud-like appearance around it. In Nature, 2121, there is an account by Mr. S. W. Clifton, Collector of Customs at Fremantle, Western Australia, sent to the Melbourne Observatory. A clear day, appearance of a small black cloud moving not very swiftly, bursting into a ball of fire of the apparent size of the moon. Or that something with the velocity of an ordinary meteorite could not collect vapor around it, but that slower moving objects, speed of a railway train, say, may. The clouds of tornadoes have so often been described as if they were solid objects that I now accept that sometimes they are, that some so-called tornadoes are objects hurtling through this Earth's atmosphere, not only generating disturbances by their suctions, but crushing with their bulk all things in their way, rising and falling, and finally disappearing, demonstrating that gravitation is not the power that the primitives think it is, if an object moving at relatively low velocity be not pulled to this earth, or being so momentarily affected bounds away. End of chapter 17a. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago. gis.depaul.edu/pmcafee Chapter 17b of the Book of the Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee. The Book of the Damned by Charles Fort. Chapter 17b. In Finley's Reports on the Character of 600 Tornadoes, very suggestive bits of description occur. Cloud bounded along the earth like a ball. Or that it was no meteorological phenomenon, but something very much like a huge solid ball that was bounding along, crushing and carrying with it everything within its field. Cloud bounded along, coming to the earth every 800 or 1,000 yards. Here's an interesting bit that I got somewhere else. I offer it as a datum in superbiology, which, however, is a branch of advanced science that I'll not take up, restricting to things indefinitely called objects. The tornado came wriggling, jumping, whirling like a great green snake, darting out a score of glistening fangs. Though it's interesting, I think that's sensational myself. It may be that vast green snakes sometimes rush past this earth, taking a swift bite wherever they can. But as I say, that's a superbiologic phenomenon. Finley gives dozens of instances of tornado clouds that seem to be more like solid things, swathed in clouds, than clouds. He notes that in the tornado at Americus, Georgia, July 18, 1881, a strange sulfurous vapor was emitted from the cloud. In many instances, objects or meteoritic stones that have come from this Earth's externality have had a sulfurous odor. 
Why a wind effect should be sulfurous is not clear. That a vast object from external regions should be sulfurous is in line with many data. This phenomenon is described in the Monthly Weather Review, July 1881, as a strange sulfurous vapor burning and sickening all who approached close enough to breathe it. The conventional explanation of tornadoes as wind effects, which we do not deny in some instances, is so strong in the United States that it is better to look elsewhere for an account of an object that has hurtled through this Earth's atmosphere, rising and falling and defying this Earth's gravitation. Nature, 7 112. That, according to a correspondent to the Birmingham Morning News, the people living near King's Sutton, Banbury, saw about one o'clock, December 7, 1872, something like a haycock hurtling through the air. Like a meteor, it was accompanied by fire and a dense smoke, and made a noise like that of a railway train. It was sometimes high in the air and sometimes near the ground. The effect was tornado-like. Trees and walls were knocked down. It's a late day now to try to verify this story, but a list is given of persons whose property was injured. We are told that this thing then disappeared all at once. These are the smaller objects, which may be derailed railway trains or big green snakes, for all I know, but our expression upon approach to this earth by vast dark bodies, that likely they'd be made luminous, would envelop in clouds, perhaps, or would have their own clouds, but that they'd quake, and that they'd affect this earth with quakes, and that then would occur a fall of matter from such a world, or rise of matter from this earth to a nearby world, or both fall and rise, or exchange of matter, process known to advanced seismology as celestio metathesis. Except that, if matter from some other world, and it would be like someone to get it into his head that we absolutely deny gravitation, just because we cannot accept orthodox dogmas, except that, if matter from another world, filling the sky of this earth generally, as to a hemisphere, or locally, should be attracted to this earth, it would seem thinkable that the whole thing should drop here, and not merely its surface materials. Objects upon a ship's bottom. From time to time they drop to the bottom of the ocean. The ship does not. Or, like our acceptance upon dripping from aerial ice fields, we think of only a part of a nearby world succumbing, except in being caught in suspension to this Earth's gra gravitation and surface materials falling from that part. Explain or express or accept. And what does it matter? Our attitude is, here are the data. See for yourself. What does it matter what my notions may be? Here are the data. But think for yourself, or think for myself. All mixed up we must be. A long time must go by before we can know Florida from Long Island. So we've had data of fishes that have fallen from our now established and respectabilized Super Sargasso Sea, which we've almost forgotten. It's now so respectable. But we shall have data of fishes that have fallen during earthquakes. These, we accept, were dragged down from ponds or other worlds that have been quaked when only a few miles away by this earth some other world also quaking this earth. In a way, or in its principle, our subject is orthodox enough. Only grant proximity of other worlds, which, however, will not be a matter of granting, but will be a matter of data. 
and one conventionally conceives of their surfaces quaked, even of a whole lake full of fishes being quaked and dragged down from one of them. The lake full of fishes may cause a little pain to some minds, but the fall of sand and stones is pleasantly enough thought of. More scientific persons, or more faithful hypnotics than we, have taken up this subject unpainfully, relatively to the moon. For instance, Perry has gone over 15,000 records of earthquakes, and he has correlated many with proximities of the moon, or has attributed many to the pull of the moon when nearest to this earth. Also, there is a paper upon this subject in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Cornwall, 1845. Or, theoretically, when at its closest to this earth, the moon quakes the face of this earth, and is itself quaked, but does not itself fall to this earth. As to showers of matter that may have come from the moon at such times, one can go over old records and find what one pleases. That is what we now shall do. Our expressions are for acceptance only. Our data. We take them from four classes of phenomena that have preceded or accompanied earthquakes. Unusual clouds, darkness profound, luminous appearances in the sky, and falls of substances and objects, whether commonly called meteoric or not. Not one of these occurrences fits in with principles of primitive or primary seismology, and every one of them is a datum of a quaked body passing close to this earth or suspended over it. To the primitives, there is not a reason in the world why a convulsion of this earth's surface should be accompanied by unusual sights in the sky, by darkness, or by the fall of substances or objects from the sky. As to phenomena like these, or storms, preceding earthquakes, the irreconcilability is still greater. It was before 1860 that Perry made his great compilation. We take most of our data from lists compi compiled long ago. Only the safe and unpainful have been published in recent years, at least in ambitious, voluminous form. The restraining hand of the system, as we call it, whether it has any real existence or not, is tight upon the sciences of today. The uncanniest aspect of our quasi-existence that I know of is that everything that seems to have one identity has also as high a seeming of everything else. In this oneness of allness, or continuity, the protecting hand strangles, the parental stifles. Love is inseparable from phenomena of hate. There is only continuity, that is, in quasi-existence. Nature, at least in its correspondence columns, still evades this protective strangulation, and the monthly weather review is still a rich field of unfaithful observation. But in looking over other long-established periodicals, I have no noted their glimmers of quasi-individuality fade gradually. After about 1860, and the surrender of their attempted identities to a higher attempted organization, some of them expressing intermediateness wide endeavor to localize the universal or to localize self, soul, identity, entity, or positiveness or realness held out until as far as 1880, traces findable up to 1890, and then expressing the universal process, except that here and there in the world's history, there may have been successful approximations to positiveness by individuals who only then became individuals and attained to selves or souls of their own, surrendered, submitted, 
became parts of a higher organization's attempt to individualize or systematize into a complete thing, or to localize the universal or the attributes of the universal. After the death of Richard Proctor, whose occasional illiberalities I'd not like to emphasize too much, all succeeding volumes of knowledge have yielded scarcely an unconventionality. Note the great number of times that the American Journal of Science and the Report of the British Association are quoted. Note that after, say, 1885, they're scarcely mentioned in these inspired but illicit pages, as by hypnosis and inertia we keep on saying. About 1880. Throttle and disregard. But the coercion could not be positive, and many of the excommunicated continued to creep in, or, even to this day, some of the strangled are faintly breathing. Some of our data have been hard to find. We could tell stories of great labor and fruitless quests that would, though perhaps imperceptibly, stir the sympathy of a Mr. Simons. But in this matter of concurrence of earthquakes with aerial phenomena, which are as unassociable with earthquakes, if internally caused, as falls of sand on convulsed small boys full of sour apples, the abundance of so-called evidence is so great that we can only sketchily go over the data, beginning with Robert Mallet's catalog, Report of the British Association, 1852, omitting some extraordinary instances because they occurred before the 18th century. Earthquake preceded by a violent tempest, England, January 8, 1704. Preceded by a brilliant meteor, Switzerland, November 4, 1704. Luminous cloud moving at high velocity, disappearing behind the horizon. Florence, December 9, 1731. Thick mists in the air, through which a dim light was seen, several weeks before the shock, globes of light had been seen in the air. Swabia, May 22, 1732. Reign of Earth, Carpentras, France, October 18, 1737. A Black Cloud, London, March 19, 1750. Violent Storm and a Strange Star of Octagonal Shape, Slavange, Norway, April 15, 1752. Balls of fire from a streak in the sky. Auger Mauland, 1752. Numerous meteorites. Lisbon, October 15, 1755. Terrible tempests over and over. Falls of hail and brilliant meteors. Instance after instance. An immense globe. Switzerland, November 2nd. 1761. Oblong, sulfurous cloud, Germany, April 1767. Extraordinary mass of vapor, Boulogne, April 1780. Heavens obscured by a dark mist, Grenada, August 7, 1804. Strange howling noises in the air and large spots Obscuring the Sun. Palermo, Italy, April 16, 1817. Luminous meteor moving in the same direction as the shock. Naples, November 22, 1821. Fireball appearing in the sky, apparent size of the moon. Thuringerwald, November 29, 1831. And, unless you be polarized by the new dominant, 
which is calling for recognition of multiplicities of external things as a dominant, dawning new over Europe in 1492, called for recognition of terrestrial externality to Europe. Unless you have this contact with the new, you have no affinity for these data. Beans that drop from a magnet. Irreconcilables that glide from the mind of a Thompson. Or my own acceptance that we do not really think at all. That we correlate around supermagnets that I call dominance. A spiritual dominant in one age and responsively to it upspring monasteries, and the stake and the cross are its symbols. A materialist dominant, and upspring laboratories, and microscopes, and telescopes, and crucibles are its icons, that were nothing but iron filings relatively to a succession of magnets that displace preceding magnets with no soul of your own and with no soul of my own except that some day some of us may no longer be intermediatisms but may hold out against the cosmos that once upon a time thousands of fishes were cast from one pail of water we have psychovalency for these data if we're obedient slaves to the new dominant and repulsion to them, if we're mere correlates to the old dominant. I'm a soulless and selfless correlate to the new dominant, myself. I see what I have to see. The only inducement I can hold out in my attempt to rake up disciples is that someday the new will be fashionable. The new correlates will sneer at the old correlates. After all, there is some inducement to that, and I'm not altogether sure it's desirable to end up as a fixed star. As a correlate to the new dominant, I am very much impressed with some of these data. The luminous object that moved in the same direction as an earthquake. It seems very acceptable that a quake followed this thing as it passed near this Earth's surface. The streak that was seen in the sky or only a streak that was visible of another world. And objects or meteorites that were shaken down from it. The quake at Carpentras, France. And that, above Carpentras, was a smaller world, more violently quaked, so that Earth was shaken down from it. But I like best the super wolves that were seen to cross the sun during the earthquake at Palermo. They howled, or the loves of the worlds, the call they feel for one another. They try to move closer and howl when they get there. The howls of the planets. I have discovered a new unintelligibility. In the Edinburgh New Philosophical Journal, have to go away back to 1841, Days of less efficient strangulation. Sir David Milne lists phenomena of quakes in Great Britain. I pick out a few that indicate to me that other worlds were near this Earth's surface. Violent storm before a shock of 1703. Ball of fire preceding. 1750. A large ball of fire seen upon day following a quake, 1755. Uncommon phenomenon in the air, a large luminous body, bent like a crescent, which stretched itself over the heavens, 1816. Vast ball of fire, 1750. Black rains and black snows, 1755. Numerous instances of upward projection or upward attraction during quakes preceded by a cloud, very black and lowering, 1795. Fall of black powder preceding a quake, 
by six hours, 1837. Some of these instances seem to me to be very striking. A smaller world, it is greatly racked by the attraction of this earth. Black substance is torn down from it. Not until six hours later, after an approach still closer, does this earth suffer perturbation. As to the extraordinary spectacle of a thing, world, superconstruction, that was seen in the sky in 1816, I have not yet been able to find out more. I think that here our acceptance is relatively sound, that this occurrence was tremendously of more importance than such occurrence as, say, transits of Venus, upon which hundreds of papers have been written. That not another mention have I found, though I have not looked so especially as I shall look for more data, that all but undetailed record of this occurrence was suppressed. Altogether, we have considerable agreement here between data of vast masses that do not fall to this earth, but from which substances fall, and data of fields of ice, from which ice may not fall off, but from which water may drip. I'm beginning to modify that, at a distance from this earth, gravitation has more effect than we have supposed, though less effect than the dogmatists suppose and prove. I'm coming out stronger for the acceptance of a neutral zone, that this earth, like other magnets, has a neutral zone in which is the Super Sargasso Sea, and in which other worlds may be buoyed up, though projecting parts may be subject to this Earth's attraction. But my preference... Here are the data. I now have one of the most interesting of the new correlates. I think I should have brought it in before, but whether out of place here because not accompanied by earthquake or not, we'll have it. I offer it as an instance of an eclipse by a vast dark body that has been seen and reported by an astronomer. The astronomer is M. Lias. The phenomenon was seen by him at Pernambuco, April 11, 1860. Comps Rendu. 50, 11, 97. It was about noon, sky cloudless. Suddenly the light of the sun was diminished. The darkness increased, and, to illustrate its intensity, we are told that the planet Venus shone brilliant. But Venus was of low visibility at this time. The observation that burns incense to the new dominant is that around the sun appeared a corona. There are many other instances that indicate proximity of other worlds during earthquakes. I note a few, quake and an object in the sky, called a large luminous meteor, Quarterly Journal, Royal Institute, 5.132. Luminous body in the sky, earthquake and fall of sand, Italy, February 12th and 13th, 1870. La Science Portu, 15159. Many reports upon luminous object in the sky and earthquake. Connecticut, February 27, 1883. Monthly Weather Review, February 1883. Luminous object or meteor in the sky. Fall of stones from the sky, and earthquake, Italy, January 20, 1891. L'Astronomie, 1891-154. Earthquake and prodigious number of luminous bodies or globes in the air. Boulon, France, June 7, 1779. Sestier, La Foudre, 1-169. Earthquake at Manila, 1863, and curious luminous appearance in the sky. 
Ponton, Earthquakes, page 124. The most notable appearance of fishes during an earthquake is that of Rio Bamba. Humboldt sketched one of them, and it's an uncanny looking thing. Thousands of them appeared on the ground during this tremendous earthquake. Humboldt says that they were cast up from subterranean sources. I think not myself, and have data for thinking not. But there'd be such a row, arguing back and forth, that it's simpler to consider a clearer instance of the fall of living fishes from the sky, during an earthquake. I can't quite accept, myself, whether a large lake, and all the fishes in it, was torn down from some other world, or a lake in the Super Sargasso Sea, distracted between two pulling worlds, was dragged down to this earth. Here are the data. La Science pour tout, 6191. February 16, 1861. An earthquake at Singapore. Then came an extraordinary downpour of rain, or as much water as any good-sized lake would consist of. For three days this rain, or this fall of water, came down in torrents. In pools on the ground formed by this deluge, great numbers of fishes were found. The writer says that he had himself seen nothing but water fall from the sky. Whether I'm emphasizing what a deluge it was or not, he says that so terrific had been the downpour that he had not been able to see three steps away from him. The natives said that the fishes had fallen from the sky. Three days later, the pools dried up, and many dead fishes were found. But in the first place, though that's an expression for which we have an instinctive dislike, the fishes had been active and uninjured. Then follows material for another of our little studies in the phenomena of disregard. A psychotropism here is mechanically to take pen in hand and mechanically write that fishes found on the ground after a heavy rainfall came from overflowing streams. The writer of the account says that some of the fishes had been found in his courtyard, which was surrounded by high walls, paying no attention to this, a correspondent, La Science pour tout, 6317, explains that in the heavy rain a body of water had probably overflowed, carrying fishes with it. We are told by the first writer that these fishes of Singapore were of a species that was very abundant near Singapore. So I think myself that a whole lake full of them had been shaken down from the Super Sargasso Sea under the circumstances we have thought of. However, if appearance of strange fishes after an earthquake be more pleasing in the sight or to the nostrils of the new dominant, we faithfully and piously supply that incense. An account of the occurrence at Singapore was read by M. de Castelnau before the French Academy. M. de Castelnau recalled that upon a former occasion he had submitted to the Academy the circumstance that fishes of a new species had appeared at the Cape of Good Hope after an earthquake. It seems proper, and it will give luster to the new orthodoxy, now to have an instance in which not merely quake and fall of rocks or meteorites, or quake and either eclipse or luminous appearances in the sky have occurred, but in which are combined all the phenomena, one or more of which, when accompanying earthquake, indicate, in our acceptance, the proximity of another world. This time, a longer duration is indicated than in other instances. In the Canadian Institute Proceedings 2-7-198, there is an account by the Deputy Commissioner at Dhurmsala of the extraordinary Dhurmsala meteorite, coated with ice. But the combination of events related by him is still more extraordinary that within a few months of the fall of this meteorite, there had been a fall of live fishes at Benares, 
a shower of red substance at Furuk Abad, a dark spot observed on the disk of the sun, an earthquake, an unnatural darkness of some duration, and a luminous appearance in the sky that looked like an aurora borealis. But there's more to this climax. We are introduced to a new order of phenomena. Visitors. The deputy commissioner writes that, in the evening, after the fall of the Durmsala meteorite, or mass of stone covered with ice, he saw lights. Some of them were not very high. They appeared and went out and reappeared. I have read many accounts of the Durmsala meteorite, July 28, 1860, but never in any other of them a mention of this new correlate. Something as out of place in the 19th century as would have been an aeroplane, the invention of which would not, in our acceptance, have been permitted in the 19th century, though adumbrations to it were permitted. This writer says that the lights moved like fire balloons, but I am sure that they were neither fire balloons, lanterns, nor bonfires, or any other thing of that sort, but bona fide lights in the heavens. It's a subject for which we shall have to have a separate expression. Trespassers upon territory to which something else has a legal right. Perhaps someone lost a rock, and he and his friends came down looking for it in the evening, or secret agents or emissaries who had an appointment with certain esoteric ones near Durm Sala, things or beings coming down to explore and unable to stay down long. In a way, another strange occurrence during an earthquake is suggested. The ancient Chinese tradition, the marks like hoof marks in the ground. We have thought, with a low degree of acceptance, of another world that may be in secret communication with certain esoteric ones of this earth's inhabitants, and of messages in symbols like hoof marks that are sent to some receptor or special hill upon this earth, and of messages that at times miscarry. This other world comes close to this world. There are quakes, but advantage of proximity is taken to send a message. The message designed for a receptor in India, perhaps, or in Central Europe, miscarries all the way to England. Marks, like the marks of the Chinese tradition, are found upon a beach in Cornwall after an earthquake. Philosophical Transactions, 5500. After the quake of July 15, 1757, upon the sands of Penzance, Cornwall, in an area of more than 100 square yards were found marks like hoof prints, except that they were not crescentic. We feel a similarity, but note an arbitrary disregard of our own, this time. It seems to us that marks described as little cones surrounded by basins of equal diameter would be like hoof prints, if hoofs printed complete circles. Other disregards are that there were black specks on the tops of cones, as if something perhaps gaseous had issued from them that from one of these formations came a gush of water as thick as a man's wrist. Of course, the opening of springs is common in earthquakes, but we suspect, myself, that the negative absolute is compelling us to put in this datum and its disorders. There's another matter in which the negative absolute seems to work against us. Though to superchemistry we have introduced the principle of celestial metathesis, we have no good data of exchange of substances during proximities. The data are all of falls and not of upward translations. Of course, upward impulses are common during earthquakes, but I haven't a datum upon a tree or a fish or a brick or a man that ever did go up and stay up 
and that never did come down again. Our classic of the horse and barn occurred in what was called a whirlwind. It is said that in an earthquake in Calabria, paving stones shot up far in the air. The writer doesn't specifically say that they came down again, but something seems to tell me they did. The Corpses of Riobamba Humboldt reported that in the quake of Riobamba, bodies were torn upward from graves, that the vertical motion was so strong that bodies were tossed several hundred feet in the air. I explain. I explain that if, in the center of greatest violence of an earthquake, anything ever has gone up, and has kept on going up, the thoughts of the nearest observers were very likely upon other subjects. The key of Lisbon. We are told that it went down. A vast throng of persons ran to the key for refuge. The city of Lisbon was in profound darkness. The key and all the people on it disappeared. If it and they went down, not a single corpse, not a shred of clothing, not a plank of the key, nor so much as a splinter of it, ever floated to the surface. End of chapter 17 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, G.I.S. Dot DePaul dot edu slash p mcafee